he doesn't hear them discussed enough. Uh, the one question is, why is the Holocaust a problem for the Middle East? You hear that a great deal. Uh, the uh, Middle Eastern countries, the Palestinians, didn't murder Jews during World War II. Uh, so why should it be a problem for the Middle East to deal with all the Holocaust refugees? Uh, question uh, number two is, uh, why do we not hear more conversation about uh, Arab refugees, uh, refu Jewish refugees from Arab nations? And actually, you cited 500,000. It's much closer to 800,000 who are refugees from uh, Morocco, from uh, Iraq, from Iran, uh, from all of the Islamic countries. Anyone want to take that question? Well, let me start with this. Uh, in terms of the, the Nazification efforts during World War II, Jeffrey Herf, H-E-R-F, very, very capable, very bright historian, has written an entire book on this. Part of what's remarkable about the book is, Herf says the archives, he's a German scholar, he said the archives were there for years, and no historian would touch it. But there was, now it's, it, it, I'm not gonna get into the complexities of this, but the Germans were very careful. They understood what in Nazism would resonate in the Middle East, and they poured this in. There was a denazification effort after the war. In Europe, there was never any kind of denazification effort, of course, in the Middle East. In terms of the refugees from, uh, Jewish refugees from Arab countries, it's a very, very important point, as is this point. There are those who are calling for genocide in the Middle East. Again, as you know, Ahmadinejad basically is, Hamas certainly is, Hezbollah certainly is. There are also those who are simply calling for ethnic cleansing. I would ask our friends on the left, how can you be in favor of ethnic cleansing? What you're looking at here is a Middle East that is Judenreich, that, is, that there are no Jews, there are no Christians, the Christian minority is been decimated all throughout the Middle East, and no minorities whatsoever. It's why the Kurds, for example, I was in Kurdistan not long ago, why they have so much quiet, not so quiet, support for Israel, they understand that a Middle East without Jews will soon be a Middle East without any minorities, including them. Mm. Uh, the question. Uh, thinks he has a great debater's point, you know, why did you bother, why, you know, oh, the Europeans committed the Holocaust, why did you make the Palestinian people suffer for that? which is a complete misreading of uh, Israel's history. Israel's history did not begin in 1945. The movement to uh, settle the ancient land of Israel on which Jews have been living since uh, the, the second millennium before the Common Era, um, you know, what, did not begin uh, just uh, after World War II. It has been an ongoing project, the, the first Aliyah in the 1880s and so on. So, the, that is a, just a complete misreading of what the founding of Israel was all about. There's no question that the Holocaust had an effect on some members of the United Nations who voted in favor of the creation of the State of Israel, but it was not by any stretch the whole story. The, and this is very, very important, and this combines the two points that you made, and, and they're, they're both important points. By any demographic analysis, the percentage of the Israeli population that is descended from Jews of Middle Eastern countries is five times larger than the percentage of Israel made up of Holocaust refugees. Israel had a population, the, the Yeshua had a population of just a tad under 600,000 at the beginning of the war. And the British sealed off the land of Israel from any refugees from Nazi Germany. They had the infamous white paper. The whole idea that Israel was populated by survivors from Hitler, yes, there are many Holocaust survivors in Israel, but far more refugees from uh, the Islamic states in the Middle East, which deliberately didn't ex formally expel Jews, but uh, smiled upon riots and persecution that drove them out of their homes. Speaking of riots and persecution, David Horowitz, the second question quickly to you from Arnold Gold. Is it getting better out there on college campuses in terms of fighting the Islamo-Nazis? Well, <clears throat> the politics uh, is always uh, dialectical, if you will. Um, and uh, it's getting a lot worse from the point of view of the Jew hatred that's open and organized. Um, on college campuses. Uh, there are now the Muslim Students Association is an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
It's part of the terrorist jihad. It's coddled. There are 650 Muslim student organizations. It's really the only Muslim student organization on campuses. Tremendously favored by all university administrations. Uh, well, I'll give you one choice example. Uh, I've spoken to 400 campuses. I've only been banned on one which is the University of St. Louis, a Catholic institution uh, in St. Louis. Uh, of course, they don't just, they don't ban you. They, they throw all these obstacles. So um, they said I, if I appeared, I, there had to be somebody framing uh, the, uh, the evening uh, with Catholic values. Um, of course, I accepted that. Um, and that why we haven't heard back from them anyway. But that, the very week I got that news from the students who had invited me, St. Louis University held a three-day conference sponsored by, held by the Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Student Association. And I looked over the agendas and one of the panels uh, was uh, to defeat the argument that uh, Islam discriminates against women in any way and to show why, and these are the words, Islam is the perfect religion. This is a Catholic school. Oh, uh, so I'm banned. Oh, but, uh, okay. Um, across the country, the Muslim Students Association is holding Israel Apartheid Weeks every spring, capped by Nakba commemorations, which is a genocidal uh, day, all financed by university funds. The somewhat good news is that some of the Jewish kids are finally going to stand up to these groups. The Hillel organization has been absolutely terrible. It's all about appeasement. It's all about, all they want to do is build bridges to people who want to kill them. And this is the biggest problem that Jews have, which is the desire to prove that we're superior to other people. The other people would never have uh, vacated Gaza and leave it to a terrorist state. Other people do not, they do not as a, as a group turn the other cheek when they are faced with people who want to kill them. This will be fatal in the long run to the Jews, not only because it, the appeasement doesn't work, but it incites, people see us as arrogant in doing this. So we, we like every, every people, Christians do it as well, try to set a standard of decency and humanity but don't dig your own grave in the process. Okay. We have about six more minutes. So uh, third question, uh, Mona or uh, Cliff, do you want to take the question? Is it possible to reform Islam or is, is Islam ultimately unreformable? You want to do that? I'll, st I'll start on you. Look. Islam is about 700 years younger than Christianity. 700 years ago, Christianity was dominated by the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, I think it's very possible that you could have a mellowing of Islam over the next 700 years, but we don't have 700 years to wait. <laughs> they say history repeats itself, but in each round the weapon weapons get more lethal. And that's clearly the case right now. I will tell you this, look, I know Muslim reformers, serious reformers, and they are incredibly uh, courageous individuals. There are Muslim moderates. The moderates, I would say, are sort of on the fence. They're not going to risk their way, their lives either way. Plenty of Muslims out there who are traditionalists and who really don't want to be into a fight. The real problem is this, that the money and power in the Islamic world is where? With Saudi Arabia, which has the Wahhabi strain of Islam, which is belligerent and in which in the Wahhabi mosques every Friday night in Saudi Arabia they preach that Christians and Jews are vermin and that and Wahhabism leads directly to bin Ladenism because if we're vermin somebody has to exterminate us. And then you have the money and the power that Iran has. Why, do they, why, why is there so much money and power in Saudi Arabia and Iran? Well because we're because of oil. That's why. Because American engineers found oil beneath Saudi soil in the 1930s because European inventors came up with the internal combustion engine. So long as we are addicted to oil and so long as